So we are recording uh, to the cloud. Thanks everyone for coming to the fifth 1559 implementers call. Um, just share the agenda in the chat. Uh, basically, there were a couple things I wanted to cover today. First, just to get kind of a status update uh, on both the implementers and researchers side. Uh, so I think Abdel and, and Barnaby can, can help cover that. Um, uh, we had the uh, merge transaction pool PR to talk about with that gut decided async. So that's already merged in. Um, and the two other things I guess I'd like to, to get people's thoughts here on are uh, the survey I just shared uh, last night, uh, which gave a lot of, uh, I guess, projects, uh, concerns about 1559. Uh, I'm mostly interested in like the stuff that relates to implementers around JSON RPCs and opcodes and whatnot. And uh, if people have suggestions of how we can uh, plan uh, to just include that to make it easier for projects to test. Um, and then there was this other document like the mainnet readiness checklist to just kind of walk through what are the things we'd like to see uh, from 1559 before it, it gets ready to bring back the all core devs for mainnet considerations. I know last time we had talked about uh, moving to like a proof of work testnet. Uh, so I'm curious to get everyone's thoughts on that and what the best next step is um, from where we are right now. Um, yeah, so maybe we can start with Updates. Uh, Abdel, do you want to just give a kind of yes. overview? Like, of, I think it's been like a month since the last call. So what uh, you and the other implementers have been working on? Yeah. Uh, so you, we have been working on uh, implementing the latest changes from the specification. Uh, so the computation of the base feed uh, has been changed and we updated uh, the implementation accordingly. We already deployed the testnet from scratch and uh, we were able to sync also with uh, an determined client, so, which is great. And now I'm finalizing the the remaining changes, the removal of the transition period, and uh, also the use of a single transaction pool. So that will be available, uh, I hope, tomorrow. And I will uh, restart a fresh test net with uh, the, a version aligned with the latest specification. Uh, we are also aligned with uh, about the gas price uh, behavior. So Mika submitted a PR and uh, I approved it and it has been merged. So we decided that the gas price opcode should return the effective uh, price the user uh, will pay. Actually, this is a minimum between fee cap and uh, minor, bribe, minor bribe plus uh, the base fee. Uh, and yeah. This is it. And uh, yeah, I was able to spam the network and reach uh, almost uh, the maximum block elasticity. So I was able to, to target uh, 38 million gas blocks. And uh, yeah, everything was fine. So this is pretty cool. That's it. That's great. Um, do you know, uh, you mentioned like uh, you're working on the latest changes of the spec. Do you know where uh, the Go implementation and the Nethermind implementation are at with regards to that? Uh, I think uh, like client is on the call, so maybe he can give uh, an update for, about Nethermind. But I know that uh, uh, get, is, uh, get people, so Vulcanize is still uh, investigating the consensus issue. So I'm giving them some help using the transaction sender tool to try to reproduce the consensus issue. Okay. And yeah, do you know about Nethermind? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I said that I think that oh. uh, there is someone in the... I don't, I don't think so. Light time no. is not from Nethermind. Ah, oh, sorry. No, okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Nethermind, so they are also aligned on the basic computation. And I saw in the chat that uh, I, she, uh, he already removed the transition period. So that should be fine uh, when I will redeploy these nodes. We should be able to sync again. Great. Uh, I know someone kind of jumped in to say something while you were talking. No? OK. Um, Cool. Uh, Barnaby, do you want to give a quick update on, on the R&D side? 
Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tim. Um, so recently I've published a notebook on strategic users. That was the latest, let's say, public release. The, the idea behind it was to kind of look at this idea that, uh, well, 1559 is useless because anyways, users will keep competing on the tip. And I think what the notebook really shows is that uh, you can have this sort of strategic behavior, but it doesn't last very long when the network is not subject to wide, let's say, shifts in demand, which is most of the time. So yeah, that was published. Maybe I can drop the link in the chat after. That would be great. Um, yeah. We've been working with Fred, who's on the call, uh, looking at the transition period out of the legacy transactions and into 1559. So trying to model it, trying to simulate it, and even trying to look at an idea that was floated around the Discord channel uh, to have some kind of tax on legacy transaction where the tax is increasing over time, uh, which is kind of like the, let's say, the stick to the carrot of making users uh, shift out of using the legacy transaction and into uh, 1559. So we, we intend to, to model it. Um, then another notebook on the floating escalator or the combination between 1559 and escalator. So trying to understand a bit better like what it looks like. Uh, I know that the escalator hasn't been like, really talked about for some time and I feel the consensus is more like, okay, we should just go ahead with 1559 and not really bother with the escalator. But anyways, I think it's still interesting in the, in terms of like research, even as let's say an extension to this um, strategic behavior notebook. So yeah, that's under review and it should be published also fairly soon. And the last one that I've been working on and that I think is quite nice. So when the, let's say strategic user tackles this idea that uh, 1559 is just going to de degenerate into like a first price auction. Yep. The learning users, I'm trying to tackle the idea that uh, 1559 is a UX improvement. So this is, I think is not really understood really well by users or by whoever is looking at 1559. Like what do we mean by UX improvement exactly? And so what this learning agent notebook is trying to show is that uh, over time agents learn to Either bid, either take the price that 1559 is giving them, so basically the base fee, or leave, not 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 even enter the, the, the queue. And in that sense, it's, an, it's a UX improvement because over time you're learning to just become like a price taker. So the market is just quoting you, okay, it's 100 way to get in now, take it or leave it. And, and that's it most of the time. So And so you see over time with these learning users that after a while, like we understand that, okay, I should, I should probably just uh, either take it or, or leave it. And, and you can really see then uh, like this idea of UX improvement dynamically, let's say appearing just from the interactions of the user. So I think it's quite, quite interesting. And then related to that, um, I think it's something I've discussed maybe in the Discord channel, but looking at wallet defaults. So this idea that most of the time you're a price taker but sometimes the base fee is shifting very rapidly. So you have like a Uniswap launching their token or something. And then you might not want to be a price taker anymore. Like then you might want to revert back to this uh, strategic behavior, which I look at in the first notebook. And in that case, probably you also want your wallet to kind of shift from this price taker or at least price quarter mode to a mode where it gives you more flexibility to say, no, I really want this transaction to go in quickly. So I'm, I'm willing to pay a much higher premium. So when should that be? Like when should you switch from one mode to the other? And what should the defaults be in the wallet? So most likely defaults would look like what you currently have in MetaMask, like free, like fast, medium, slow, something like this. But uh, how should we set these parameters? So yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. But, that's great. Um, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> so, uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, I guess the first one around like the, the transition period, um, do you think are you like that still makes sense if we've like removed it from the EAP with the with Mika's recent PR? Ooh, I should have specified that the transition period we're looking at is Mika's PR. So I'm, I'm not looking at the previous model of okay. the, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at Mika's where you cast the legacy transactions into the 1559 form. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, cool. 
Um, yeah, anyone have thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, um, in, in that case, yeah, I guess uh, I can share my screen real quick. Um, so uh, Pooja, myself, and a couple other folks from Cat Herders uh, spent the past few weeks reaching out to a bunch of projects to get their thoughts uh, on 1559. Um, so there was a lot of uh, feedback. We shared a report uh, detailing most of it. Um, I'm not sure most of it is relevant for this call, but uh, the bit around implementation really is. Uh, and so I was curious to get people's thoughts about how we can address kind of uh, how we could address the things that people mentioned would help them prioritize 1559 support. So we asked projects, you know, what would make your life as easy as possible to support this. Um, and obviously the first thing that came up uh, or the thing that came up the, the most often was having a public test net. Um, but especially having one that's uh, suitable for, for like end user applications to use. So that has JSON RPC support for 1559. Um, and, and it was also mentioned that it would be great if this was kind of standardized across clients uh, so that uh, there's not like any major differences between how uh, base two and, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I would suggest something about that. Uh, yep. Instead of implementing the uh, RPC endpoint in each client, I yep. would suggest, uh, suggest that we implement only one microservice dedicated to that, that will take IP1559 transaction parameters and will uh, create and sign the transaction and submit them to uh, Ethereum client. Unless we think we will have it in production on mainnet, but I'm not sure. Uh, I think we can leverage that and avoid that uh, every client team implement it. So that would work for sending, but would it also work for reading transactions? Because I think that was one of the other concerns that came out, like just being able to query, you know, uh, the transactions and, and whatnot on the network. Mm. I see what you mean. Yeah. Like, how do you expose them right now in the block explorer? Uh, basically, oh, yeah, maybe we can update the front end, actually, and uh, implement the decoding logic. Actually, yeah, that, that, that will be easier, actually, to display. Uh, if 15, if, if 1559 transaction parameters directly in the explorer. Yeah, but I guess what I'm wondering is how does the explorer get the data from Basu right now? Like, how does it query it? Oh, uh, I don't remember the exact endpoint, but uh, okay, yeah. because there is I such. A, I feel like if there's something already in Basu that uh, at least you know, the block explorer we have used, maybe that's a good first starting point for something we can like standardize across clients and just make mm. a bit more explicit. Um, okay. So it might be worth looking into that. Okay, yeah, I will do that. Um, so yeah, just taking a quick note. Um, yeah, and then uh, obviously the other thing people mentioned was like having it be part of a network upgrade. I'm not sure we're, we're quite there yet. Um, and then this might be interesting for you, uh, Barnabé, but uh, the incent, like a couple of projects mentioned, like if there was any incentive uh, with regards to gas prices specifically to use 1559, they, they, they would prioritize it. I think Mika's PR kind of gets us half of the way there at least, right? Where if you can keep using legacy transactions, you'll just pay a higher tip to the miners. Um, so the, I guess the converse of that is like, if you use 1559, you'll pay a lower, lower price um yeah i don't know i think that's maybe sufficient to start but i'm curious if other people have thoughts about that uh, do we understand from that that like the project is incentivized to implement 1559 so that its users get to yes like, transact yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah, and, and, and that was like, I guess the common theme for the projects who are most willing to implement 1559 as soon as possible are projects who really cared about like their users gas price experience. Um, mm. So I think that, yeah, having having their end, the end users of, you know, someone like Argent or Gitcoin be able to pay a lower gas price was a, a, a good motivation for them. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, not incentives to to pay them to implement. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's like the net. Yeah, the transaction isn't. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, and the other thing, so the other thing that uh, was mentioned is like having obviously like the basic libraries. So ethers.js and web3.js support this as soon as possible would help uh, because a lot of projects basically just rely on that. Um, so the ethers.js uh, maintainer said it, it should be pretty easy for, for him to, to add support for it. Um, the other thing that was mentioned is yeah, just having like a clear opcode definition. Uh, so a lot of projects, smart contracts rely on transaction.gas price. I think we need to understand what are the implications of changing that. Uh, so right now, from what I understand, the, the change that was made would only affect 1559 style transactions, which shouldn't break anything that exists. Um, but I don't know if there's some weird kind of, I don't know, second order effects for contract developers that the API changes what it returns based on the type of transaction. Um, I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that. I believe we're pretty safe on that front. The way we ended up setting gas price for 1559 transactions makes it so it's basically still the same thing. So it means this is the gas price that the user paid. The one caveat is previously uh, for legacy transactions, the gas price a user paid and the gas price a miner received are the same. And 1559, the gas price a user paid and the gas price a miner received are different. And so previously, the gas price opcode could have been used to identify how much a miner received for the transaction, theoretically. A yeah. And also used to identify how much the user paid for the transaction. With 1559, it only represents how much the user paid for the transaction now. I, I, don't, th I don't know of any applications that care about how much the miner got paid. They, there are many that care about how much the user paid. And so that's why I went with yeah. that. Is that worth adding to like the security consideration section of the EAP? I feel like uh, the backwards compatibility section. Yes. Okay. Uh, send me a message after this, and I can go at it. Okay. Uh, I'll write a note for that. Um, yeah, I feel like somebody might look at that and find some something with it. But uh, that makes sense. And I guess the other thing we discussed in the past is like the base fee upcode. That's not part of the EAP yet, right? It is not, and, okay. and the, is there, there is a push. In, no, there's there's a push currently in the from the core devs for various reasons to actually get rid of gas inspectability in general from the EVM, and so that would probably hurt our chances of inclusion if we're adding things that make it so people can inspect gas stuff. Okay, and I guess so. so right I, now, the only way to get the opcode is to get the block header. Right. Yeah, you could. So you, you could prove it on chain. So you could yeah. get the transaction proof and then uh, prove it based on the block hash if you really wanted to. But yeah. that can only be done afterwards. So it'd have to be the next block that you could do that. Yeah, and I think that kind of relates to the to the next point is people would like to see kind of an API that takes, you know, that tells you what the base fee will be for this block. So you take the previous block, you calculate how full it was, and therefore you estimate what the next block's base fee will be. Um, I'm not sure this falls like within the, the like skills of, of people in this group, um, but something like that, the sort of eat gas station like API that just does that that math for them is, is something people mentioned that would make it easier for them to uh, to add support for 1559. I don't think that would be particularly difficult. Yeah, yeah, and and, and they, is, they, yeah, go ahead. They want that from the clients. No, no, or no. They want that just like a place they can go on the internet. A place they can go on the internet, and yeah, I'm. This call oh, is recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube, so maybe somebody picks this up. Eat gas station if you're listening. Um, yeah, that was <laughs> that was brought up. Um, and then, yeah, obviously the, the rest was kind of pretty standard, but you know, just having good documentation, uh, like we just mentioned, I think around the, you know, the opcodes and, and explaining what the changes in behaviors are, uh, communicating changes to the EAP and, and whatnot and having channels for support. And I think with the Discord there, it's been kind of a decent place so far if 
if like the volume grows, um, we can maybe move to, to some other place uh, for, for support specifically. But uh, yeah, that was kind of the list of what, what would help various projects kind of implement the EAP. One thing that was nice in this survey as well is there was like a pretty, uh, yeah, th there was like a pretty smooth distribution of like when projects would like start would want to start working on the EAP. So I feel like as this develops, we'll probably get more and more users who are slowly kind of trickling in and are interested. Um, so it's nice to just start with kind of a smaller batch of people who are like very interested in this and, and want to see it done ASAP and then slowly reach out to, to more projects. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's basically what I had on that. And then the last thing, I wanted to, to bring up was just this kind of mainnet readiness checklist. So I think a lot of people in the community had been asking for a date for 1559 because that's obviously impossible to give to people. Uh, the other approach is to, to, to give them a list of things to do um, and, and, and try to obviously update it as, as we learn new information and, and, and we make progress on it. Um, so in short, obviously we need all clients to have an implementation. Uh, right now, Geth, Basu, and Nethermind are working on it. Nethermind, I believe, is still hiring someone uh, as well to, to do this. So if, if you're watching this and you're interested, uh, you, can, you can click the link and, uh, and uh, apply for the job. Um, Open Ethereum uh, and, and TurboGet are fine with joining the implementation later. Uh, I've talked with, with them, and um, I think you know, they don't have as much interest in implementing every incremental version of the EAP. Uh, but uh, once it's, it's actually done and settled, uh, it shouldn't be a, a major challenge for them to implement it, especially with the, the recent changes to the transaction pool and whatnot. Uh, that makes it a bit, uh, a bit simpler for clients to, to implement. In terms of like the open issues, uh, I think the biggest one, uh, we discussed this on the last All Core Devs, but is the denial of service risk on mainnet. Um, this is something I don't think EIP 1559 can address head on. Uh, there's a couple efforts that are being done to address this. So there's EIP 2929, uh, Geth is working on Snapshot Sync, Basu is working on a, another flat database uh, approach uh, that, that, that makes these uh, denial of service attacks uh, less likely. Uh, TurboGet uh, from the start is optimized to, to, to deal with that as well. Um, and so I don't think Again, 1559 can like directly address that. When I asked about changing the block slack limit, uh, people didn't seem to think that would make big enough of a difference. So going from you know 1.5 to X instead of 2X didn't seem like it, 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 would, uh, it would make 1559 much more likely to, to be adopted sooner. Uh, but it's really more about uh, having like client level, uh, basically databases that store the state uh, in a flat format instead of a try and, and everything that goes around that. Um, I don't think it should have a major impact in terms of timelines if given that there's still work left on 1559 that it won't be in the Berlin upgrade. It, you know, I think it, it should probably land in the upgrade after that. Um, and that also gives time to clients to work on that. Uh, and then the next up, the transaction pool management. This is basically moot. Uh, due to Mika's PR, so I'll, I'll update that. Um, the transaction encoding, decoding was the other big question. Uh, and, and I know, Abdel, you've mentioned in the past that EIP 2718 would make this easier. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what actually is the status on 2718. It's, it seems like it's kind of in limbo for Berlin. Um, I don't know if anyone has kind of a better view on it than, than me. It's uh, in limbo for Berlin. I almost certainly will go in with or prior to 1559. Okay. Like I, I don't see really any reasonable path where it doesn't go in. There's enough things depending on it that it's going to go in either Berlin or right immediately after. Okay. And does it make sense to, I guess, keep doing what we're doing for now? And once it's accepted, we adapt 1559 to, to support it? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, if it were me, I would uh, just switch everything over to 2718 so we don't have to deal with it later. Uh, like, I, I think the odds of 2718 not going in are so low that we should just move forward with it personally. Uh, but I'm not an implementer, so 
we could do something like um, if if we don't want to delay uh, security audits and all that stuff, validation of the economic model, we can deploy uh, public test net with the actual implementation because the type transaction envelope will don't change uh, any of those results. And on the integration integration test net, we could start implementing it. Maybe we can do this. So have like two versions of it. Once yeah. So once we have like a more public test net, then we get to, to that. Yeah. I think, yeah, maybe that makes sense. And it also gives us a couple of weeks to see what happens on the core dev side. Um, and if it gets accepted in the next core dev call, which is next week, I believe, um, then it, it'll be a bit clearer where things are at. Um, okay. And then the last thing was the transition period. This is also kind of, I guess, your PR, Mika, means that there's no more transaction period at all, correct? It's just we convert legacy transactions to yep. 1559 and we allow that forever. Or we interpret yep. them, sorry, as 1559 and we allow that forever. Yeah, where forever means TBD. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, but, we have no, no, no currently built mechanism for getting rid of them, at least okay. not in 1559, but some future EIP probably will, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, that makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, I think there is another thing that okay. came out from the Discord channel, uh, yeah. the replace by, by fee. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know if we want to talk about that now. So I thought, sure. uh, yeah. I think Mika has some ideas about uh, how to deal with that, adding some transaction parameters. Can you explain that quickly? If you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> so there's a few options. The I, I think I lost track, so Barnaby may know more, but the one, I think the first question is we need to establish exactly what everybody expects from the replace by fee protection. Mm. So if you just do, do replace by fee naively and you just say, hey, as long as the fee is higher, then you can replace it. You can replace a transaction with one add of ETH. So one, one way gas price increase and it's effectively a, a no-op, but it will force the whole network to propagate your transaction again. So this is a debt now service attack vector where you can just bump the transaction by insignificant amounts forever and just keep hammering the network and the network will continue to accept your transactions. Mm. So we want to avoid that. The problem is that with 1509, if you bump just the minor bribe, there's no guarantee that the minor the whole minor bribe would be taken because you could be hitting the fee cap. And in fact, it is most likely that if your transaction is pending for more than a block, you are blocked by the you're blocked by the fee cap, not by your minor bribe. And so if you're just bumping the minor bribe, then we end up with the same situation where someone can just keep up the minor bribe and not actually change their transaction at all. Like they're not paying any more. And so there's some concerns about denial of service attack vector. Mm. The, if you just bump the fee cap, similarly, if your transaction is not pending because you're blocked, then that also does nothing. Like you you pay the base fee and if the base fee is below your fee cap, you can bump that to 40 billion and you're still gonna pay the base fee. Yeah. And so bumping that doesn't actually change anything. So the, the, the last option is, well, what if we bump both? And bumping both, I think, does work in most scenarios. I think there's some edge, very edgy cases where it's possible to not have your actual fee change when you bump both. But arguably, we don't care that much about those edge cases because they're not really strong denial service vectors. And as long as we have a minimum increase, then it also doesn't matter too much. The last option is to just say that nodes will not propagate any transaction whose base fee is, sorry, whose fee cap, maybe fee cap plus minor bribe, not sure which, probably just fee cap, is less than the current base fee. This is a novel idea that we think we probably need to spend a little more time thinking about, but the, in theory, if we did this, then all transactions that were being propagated should be able to be included in a block almost immediately. Like the only reason they can't be included in a block is potentially because their minor bribe is too low. Mm. Um, what this what this does tell us, though, that we also need to talk about is if the minor bribe is zero, let's say, 
we currently don't have a mechanism for pushing that out of the pending pool. Like, uh, like it is possible to set a minor bribe that is below a minor bribe that every miner is accepting, but have a fee cap that is higher than the base fee fee cap. Should that transaction be allowed to propagate? And if so, how do we define what the minimum minor bribe is to for a transaction to propagate? Do we do it like we do currently, where we just say every every node in the network has a propagation variable where they say we were willing to propagate any transaction that has a minor bribe of this or higher? Um, that's probably the simplest solution. Mm. And we just hope those are generally set in line with miners. Um, these, these are all the things to think about and discuss. Uh, I'm currently favoring that last option where we say the nodes will not propagate any transaction that has a base fee lower than the current block's base fee, sorry, a fee cap lower than the current block's base fee, plus a minor bribe set per node at startup. So each node can define what their min minor bribe is, and that's they'll propagate everything else. So we don't propagate those Good. transactions on the P2P layer, but we we do accept them on the RPC endpoint if uh, the price is below base fee. Yeah, that would be my assumption. So that way, your okay. local node will always accept your transactions from you. Oh, like if you're talking okay. directly to your own node. It's okay. going to accept everything, just like it's, just like it does right now, I believe. Okay, it, it it's not the case in Bezo implementation, so. Uh, I reject the uh, transaction, but yeah, I will update the implementation. Okay. So I think, I believe the other clients, at least Open Ethereum and Geth, and I'm pretty sure another mine, if you are talking directly to the RPC, it will accept anything because it treats you as kind of a privileged user when it comes mm -hmm. to what it accepts. And okay. so it will accept it. And I think they all actually have a separate pending pool, sort of, where transactions are protected from being rejected ejected from the pending pool on that node if the node received it over RPC, yeah. not over yeah. the P2P. There are some rules. There is a minimum gas price and also a minimum bump uh, percentage. But yeah, if uh, the transaction comply with those rules, it will be accepted. Yeah. And this is what we do for legacy transaction, but we implemented a, a different be behavior for the 1559 transaction. But uh, OK, I see what you mean. So, so like I said, that's that's my current preference is that we go with the, we, we basically just don't propagate anything that's got yeah. a minor bribe that the node thinks is too low or a, base, a fee cap that the node thinks is too low. And then we can basically, I think we can allow basically almost any strategy for fee bumping um, for replace by fee because the things that are being propagated are all things that should really probably be mine next block. Like it is very likely that the thing that's being propagated is going to be mine very soon uh, because the base fee is high enough and the minor bribe is high enough. OK. That makes sense. Thank you. Do, do other people have thoughts on strategies there? Wait, you could still increase your fee cap indefinitely, even if it's above a base fee, right? Like, I, I agree that with this idea that you drop transactions where fee cap is lower than base fee. But how does that prevent, how does that alone prevent uh, me sending a thousand transactions with just a little bump in the fee cap every time. Like you still need the bribe and- Yeah. So, so I think we still do need a minimum percentage just like we have currently on the network, yeah. which is I think 12.5% for Geth and Open Ethereum, I think. Um, but I think it matters less whether that's a fee cap bump or a base fee bump, maybe. Or a bribe. Or both. I'm oh, sorry, bri bribe, bribe bump or fee cap bump or, or both of them. Like if, if we're kicking out transactions that aren't likely to be mined soon and we have something that the user has to keep increasing, I guess that does have to be minor bribe, doesn't it? Because if it's base fee, then they can spam. Yeah, I think you still need a, Yeah, okay. It's fine to have like the base fee greater, lower than your fee cap, but I think you still need some kind of a bump uh, yeah, rule. So, but, yeah, so the minor. Yeah. Okay, so the minor bribe has to be bumped by some percentage. Say we can keep it the same, twelve point five percent. It's easy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the fee cap can stay the same, but if fee cap of a transaction is lower than the last block's base fee, then don't propagate it over the network. That sounds good. Yeah. So I suspect as soon as we tell this to. <laughs> Uh, the Ethereum client developers, they're going to tell us that 
they're going to grumble about the dev p2p layer currently doesn't isn't synced with blocks for lack of a better term like they because of rollbacks and whatnot the dev p2p layer doesn't really know what the current state of the network is and so client implementers historically have been very pretty loath to create a dependency there where the P2P layer needs to understand what the state of the network is because you can get out of sync. Like two, two clients can not agree on the current state of the network. So client A will say, hey, I've got a new transaction. It's got a base fee that matches or is higher than, sorry, it's got a fee cap that is higher than the base fee. The node you're sending it to, however, sees a different view of the network. And so they say, no, it doesn't. You're lying to me and you're now a bad peer. And so we have the problem now where how do we tell whether a peer is bad or a peer is just on, have a different view of the network. And so I think for that reason, historically, P2P layer has not um, it's correlated with blocks at all. Like they, 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 they try really hard to not care about what the current state of the network is. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that feels like it would make things much more complicated if we needed to add the dependent, like if we needed to change kind of the statefulness of the, the P2P protocol. Um, but I mean, there are higher uh, layer. You you can do that in the transaction pool or something like that. You can flag the transaction as not eligible for inclusion in the P2P network, and you, yeah, I I think it's uh, manageable. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. That uh, at least in Bezu, I don't know get enough, but uh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I I guess yeah. What I'm saying is I would push for the similarly to how Mika you mentioned, you know, like the adding the base fee opcode kind of goes against the the current of uh, the the core devs uh, with regards to gas observability. I would try to to keep things somewhat like philosophically compatible with dev P2P. Um, but if we can if we can do that verification just at the client level before we propagate it, I think that that makes sense. I think it works as long as as long as we don't it's not a condition for flagging a a peer as bad. Like I believe the clients yeah. all have mechanisms for flagging peers as bad peers and you eventually disconnect from them. We would need to make this a condition where you say, "Thank you for the transaction. I still trust you, but I reject your transaction." Um, mm. And I don't know if we have that concept at the moment anywhere else. Like it's usually either you, either the, you receive something that is very valid and you can assert this is good, thank you, or you receive something that's bad, in which case you say you're a liar and I'm ki kicking you off of the network or I'm disconnecting from you. I don't know if that's one of the client devs might know better. I don't I don't know if we have anything that's kind of like wishy washy like that right now. This is bad that we don't have get people on the call. We should have some next time. Yeah, we so we can follow up uh, offline uh, with with them and and with other client devs to see mm. what what they think. But clearly, the whole I guess replaced by fee is kind of a big open question. We still need to to figure out. Okay. Okay. I I want to point out as well that either way, it's going to be there's going to be some amount of complexity. Like even if you don't want to do the statefulness and all. When you manage your transaction queue and when you want to check like if you don't have a rule for instance that says refuse any transaction where the fee cap is not high enough uh, you still need to look at your transaction queue and update the order based on where the base fee is and how that might change the actual tip that you receive as a miner so at some point in time i think you do need to take into account the fact that base fee is moving and that the transactions their validity is, is depending on that as well but we can do that at the client level, right? Like we don't need yeah. to do that over the P2P. And also you can manage the delta between, uh, because you know that the base fee can go up or down, uh, up to one on eight. So you can have an idea about how many blocks it would take to, in best case, uh, catch up with the transaction price. And you can evict uh, or reject transactions that are really far from the base fee. Yeah, I guess you can have like many different strategies as a client. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But so the FP2P is not considered part of the client. I understand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
yeah, that's what I was missing. Thanks. So it is part of the client, but it's a different spec. It's it's a not. Uh, it's a yeah different protocol. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the yeah and and whereas the transaction pools is kind of left to there's no rules about what clients have to do with it. Each client can do whatever they want, and they don't need to agree with yeah. each other about how they handle it. Mm -hmm. okay. Even though, even though, like you know, in practice, most of the behavior ends up being the same. At least we don't have to write a spec for it that says this is how the transaction pool works. Uh -huh. uh, so, so this is what makes it easier to do it there than in, in Dev P two P. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Cool. So I'll add that uh, and try to summarize uh, this conversation here. In the open issues. Um, other couple things uh, that were just on the list of so the testing in general, I think we haven't spent much time on. I know, Abdel, you mentioned like uh, we we should maybe start thinking about like reference tests and whatnot. Uh, I'm not sure if the EAP is like stable enough for that yet or um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think the, for example, the basic computation is stable enough to start uh, some kind of uh, reference test because otherwise each client team will implement, uh, uh, yeah, we will not leverage the work and that will be good to have this kind of test to ensure that. And it, it will also help uh, other teams when they will uh, want to implement uh, the spec let's say when Turbo get an open Ethereum, open Ethereum on to implement the heap, that will help them also. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we can, yeah, we can probably start slowly writing, you know, adding some. Um, and uh, yeah, like you mentioned, I think on, on the parts that are, that are a bit mm -hmm. more finalized. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so we kind of discussed this already. So with the community testing, um, basically the JSON RPC, Abdel, you said uh, in the chat, I think that uh, right now the Black Explorer is using get transaction by hash. So that already supports yeah. 1559? No. no. So how, sorry, I, so I guess I don't understand. How does the Block Explorer get the transaction information? Uh, currently, uh, the Block Explorer only display <coughs> the legacy uh, transaction. Oh, okay. So, for example, you have a zero gas price for uh, if oh, okay. it mentions Got it. So we but, need the... Yeah, yeah, we need to update uh, this endpoint to add uh, the minor bribe and okay. probably even the base fee. So that will be... So the base fee is in the block header though, right? Yeah, yeah. But we have the block hash uh, as the response of this uh, endpoint. So we can query okay. to okay. retrieve the block header. And I think there what would probably be best is to just come up with a spec that both we, Vulcanize and Nethermine agree on before we implement it. Uh, yeah. Because again, that came up, like I know with a lot of like the tracing APIs and whatnot, uh, clients have very different behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as part of the 1559 conversations, it came up like it would be great if the behavior here was pretty, was the same. Um, so I think it, yeah, it might make sense to just see it. if if it's if no one has like super strong divergent opinions, we should just come up with a spec and, and so do that. currently for legacy transaction, we exactly have the same output. So yeah, we can okay. still so should, do the same for the two new parameters, just aligned on the names, and we yeah. can just take the names from the spec. So that will be yeah. the best. Okay, cool. Um, so just and, just so I understand yeah. that the idea is is uh, get transaction by hash will still work as normal it's just it will also include uh one five five nine transactions and they will have a couple yeah. of different fields exactly yeah right. yeah 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 and yeah i guess bef yeah let's just ask other your clients before we commit to that but that seems reasonable to me and would that also uh eth block with the true flag for full block so the one that returns all transactions i think it's ETH get blocked by hash i believe so the one that also do it? Yes. Okay. I believe there's only two that return transactions. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, only two. Okay. Uh, do we have plans at the moment to introduce uh, or support 1559 transactions for ETH send transaction? So this is what I talked about uh, earlier. So. Um, 
my my opinion on that if this is only for testnet i would suggest that we implement a common service for that and we just deploy it in uh, the same infrastructure as the testnet so that client uh, client implementer not client but wallet pro providers and people uh, can start playing with that uh, without waiting for metamask or web 3 gs to add the new field uh, and for yeah i guess if you want to use that on mainnet uh, you will have to implement a new endpoint to submit a uh, 59 transaction uh, unless you use uh, an external signer, but uh, yeah. Would it make sense to have ETH send transaction just support either yeah. 559 or legacy transactions? Yeah, that would be best. You make some fields optional and yeah. 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 That's it. it would probably be good, Tim, to have make sure someone's tasked to actually writing the specs for those three. It'll be three new EIPs. Yeah. Oh, you, so the change, yeah, the changes to the JSON RPC have to be separate EIPs? Yeah, they, well, they should, yeah, I mean, yeah. don't have or to I do guess, anything, of course. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ideally, yes, they would be, there'd be an EIP for each of them that uh, okay. specifies the changes that are being made to the JSON RPC. And then from there, clients can implement it and wallets, providers can implement it, and MetaMask can oh. implement it, and Fury can implement it, yada, yada, yada. I thought they were, um, out of scope, the, the EIPs, no? There are some, oh, okay, they are not core EIPs. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, they're not core EIPs, they'd be interface EIPs. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so, and so we basically need one EIP per JSON RPC call, right? Yeah, and I think there's, I believe there's three of them that we need, get transaction by hash, Yeah. yeah. get block by hash, and send transaction. There might maybe yes. get blocked by number as well. I don't yeah, know. because you want to add the base field as well. Not. Yeah, get blocked by hash and get blocked by uh, number yeah. as well because you, you need to add the base field header for yeah. 1559 blocks. Yeah. And how about each send raw transaction? Does that have to change as well? No, that would not that, have changed no, because you're, no, you're just sending yeah. a byte array. It's already signed. Okay. Like, uh, the input the, output are the same. Yeah. Ignore yeah. it. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So there's four of them, and we need an E for each of those. Um, Ideally. Yeah. Mean, okay. People in the past have done one monolithic one as an editor. I recommend separates. They go, go through smoother. Mm. Okay. Um, so unless somebody on the call right now wants to commit to it, I can follow up on that. Um, I, I guess, yeah, I'm just a bit uh, cautious of because Abdel is a person and he is here uh, to throw it on him. Uh, but uh, I can definitely. Yeah. I mean, I can take some, yeah, so, as it will be the occasion to start my first uh, EIP, so yeah. Okay, I mean, sure, if you, if you want to do it, yeah, yeah. That, okay, great, sold. Um, okay. So, Abdel, uh, <laughs> we'll have you write those EIPs. Um, okay, nice. Cool. Um, okay, so yeah, I think this covers JSON RPC. Uh, public testnet, we already kind of, I, I think, is dependent on having this JSON RPC a bit more fleshed out. Um, and the... The other bit, I guess, in terms of testnet is, I'm curious right now, we have the POA network. Um, it seems like there's some small changes to make to the spec uh, before, you know, everybody's kind of all syncing and, and happy there. Is it worth starting to discuss a proof of work network now, or do we still need like a couple of weeks before that because uh, of the changes and, and of, uh, uh, I know Get ha is still having like the consensus issue on, on the POA network. I think isn't Nethermind already done? Yeah, I think Nethermind and us are syncing. Maybe like with some recent changes to the EAP, there's some small tweaks to do, but I suspect like in the next week, yeah, us and so Nethermind at least yeah. should be should be on the same network and up and running. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Nethermind supports mining. Um, not yet. At all or 1559 mining? No, not 1559. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's, something we probably want, uh, at least like, yeah, having more than one client support mining before we launch a proof of work testnet so we can actually try to mine blocks in two different clients and make sure that they all come out the same and, uh, and work. Yeah. 
and in parallel, maybe we can start uh, because we were thinking also about uh, launching a single client testnet. So that could be a single client proof of work test testnet. Uh, that, and that will be the candidate to add uh, other clients next, for example, the one to validate the economic model. Or... And do you think we could do that with Besu already? Is there anything we need to change with Besu to do that? No, that should be fine. Yeah, we could do that. Okay, so maybe it makes sense, yeah, to just start off a small base super for work test net to make sure at least everything works and we can produce blocks and we can run your mm. transaction generation script on it. Yeah. Um, and, and in the meantime, you know, we'll see over the next couple of weeks how other clients, uh, you know, get get ready and, and, and what the extent of their, their mining support is. Um, cool. And then, uh, yeah, just worth uh, mentioning, I guess, uh, Nethermind was using uh, 1559 as part, as I believe, like a private network or a, a network they're working on with uh, one of their clients. Um, so I think they might have some data to share on that in the next few weeks or months. Um, and then Filecoin and Cedo both have 1559. The Filecoin devs have joined uh, our Slack or, or Discord, sorry. Um, so yeah, if people have questions for them about how the network has gone, uh, they're there and they can, they can answer those. Um, and I guess, yeah, in terms of R&D, the biggest thing that also came out in the survey with the community is kind of the lack of a proper, uh, not like even economic analysis of the EAP, but kind of just like a proper description of the mechanism um, that people, because a lot of people's concerns when they were opposed to the EAP was there's not even like a, something to, uh, to critique, right? There's just like this EAP which specifies the behavior, but it doesn't kind of ex express the intuition behind it and whatnot. I'm not sure who could help with that, but to me that feels like something that would be valuable having a sort of, um, I, I'm not, I don't have a background in economics, so I don't know how this stuff is usually done. The sort of like econ spec version of the EAP that kind of explains why this will actually be better. I know that Tim Roughgarden is working on a comparison of 1559 versus our current model. So I'm not sure how much of it will be covered by that. Uh, but I don't know if anyone here has thoughts about how that can be done or like, yeah, ways just those concerns about not having something that specifies the economic properties of the mechanisms that, that can be shared broadly. Um, yeah. I mean, I can say that first, like the paper where Vitalik introduces 1559 has some motivation, some modeling, and I think it's been a bit overlooked by people who say there's been no economic analysis. That's where it comes from first. Uh, then the IP was written, which arguably has less, let's say, economic or at least microeconomic like motivation for it. Um, and then Tim Ravgarden, I think is, yeah, his angle is really much to say, well, what do we bring like by having EIP 1559? Like how does it change? Why is it better than the current model that we have? And, and how do we even quantify what better means, right? So yeah, I, I do expect that his uh, report will be very enlightening in terms of framing it. But okay. as I said before in the Discord, I don't expect it will be like, a, yes, we should do it or no, we shouldn't. It's, it's yeah. really more like, what is even like the correct way to, to think about this? Like what are the metrics we care about? Uh, what do we mean when we say it's a UX improvement and these sorts of things? So yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think that's good actually. I, I don't think people are looking for like a, a justification as much as a description. And, and, and I think it's probably easiest to describe by contrasting with what we have today. Um, mm. Do you have a link to the to Vitalik's paper? If you can send it in the chat, I'll add it uh, to that list there. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Um, and then the last bit, uh, I guess, Barnabé, I can link some of your notebooks here, but in terms of simulations, you mentioned you obviously kind of all the stuff you're working on right now. Um, is there anything you still think like is missing after that? Is there like other big areas you'd want us to have simulations on that? Uh, yeah, you think we haven't um, we haven't addressed yet or, or have had the bandwidth to start working on? Uh, right. So I mean, there's a few things I discussed at the very beginning of the call, yep. which is more what I'm working on. So one big chunk that I left out, but almost let's say by design, is this idea of minor collusion. Yeah. Uh, it's something that we do plan to 
let's say, simulate or at least try to get like a broader understanding yep. of what the behavior is. The reason I'm not focusing on this at the moment is because I do think the analysis by team will be at least a useful like starting point. Okay. To, to not, I mean, it's, it's kind of trivial to define something where it fails or it succeeds automatically, but, but I think it, it's not going to bring much to the discussion. So, yeah. Um, apart from that, yeah, I think I should probably help you fill that TBA because it looks like there's nothing, but yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I can send you some something. Mm. Okay, that's great. Yeah, and I'll add, I'll add all the stuff you mentioned at the beginning of the call as well. Um, so mm. uh, we, we'll have at least some, some meat there. Um, and then the last bit was the community outreach. This is still out of date. We published a report yesterday. Um, one of the big things uh, that we mentioned in the report is there was a very small number of exchanges and wallets that answered. So I think if we do more outreach, I would personally like to focus on those two groups. Um, yeah, so to just you know get more wallets perspectives. I, I feel like exchanges are, are probably less affected by this and they tend to be pretty uh, uh, reluctant to share data publicly. So I'm, I'm not sure how realistic that goal is, but I think on the wallet side, we can definitely reach out to a few more folks and, and get their perspective on it. Um, so we'll keep on doing that and the cat herders will probably have an updated version of the report. I, I don't want to give a date, but like in you know a few weeks to a month or something. Um, yeah, once we've once we've talked to a bit more people on, on that end. Um, and that's all I had on the agenda. I don't know, is there anything else people feel we should discuss? Okay, well, in that case, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, this was really good. Um, and we'll have full notes for the report and I'll, uh, for the meeting, and I'll share a summary on, on Twitter uh, in the, the next hour or so. Cool. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>